Hi, this is Elisa Costa Beer. Join us on FX Medicine next week, where I'll be talking to naturopath Daniel Sipple on how to manage the client with multiple autoimmune syndrome. Subscribe to us on your favourite podcast app and follow us on social media to make sure you never miss an episode. Welcome to FX Medicine, where we bring you the latest in evidence-based, integrative, functional and complementary medicine. I'm Emma Sutherland, and joining us on the line today is naturopath and acupuncturist Miranda Miles. Miranda is the principal practitioner and owner of The Fertile Project, an integrative and functional medicine practice combining acupuncture, naturopathy and TCM under one roof. Miranda also has extensive experience treating a wide range of hormonal issues and conditions, including thyroid health, which is what we're going to dive into today. Welcome to FX Medicine, Miranda. Thank you so much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure, Emma. We have been trying to get this together for quite a while. So it's a <laughs> delight to finally be here. It is, um, yes. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, now worldwide, thyroid disorders affect 10 times more women than men, which I find astounding. And thyroid dysfunction, yeah, is the second most common endocrine condition that affects women of reproductive age. Mm. And according to a paper on clinical practice guidelines from the Endocrine Society, thyroid antibodies are present in 5 to 15% of women of childbearing age. And as clinicians, we tend to see, I feel, quite a lot of subclinical thyroid disorders. So today Mm. I want to really delve into what testing we should be doing, what impacts the conversion of T4 to T3, the clinical relevance of reverse T3, and so many other thyroid factors. Now, Miranda, you have such extensive clinical experience in this area. I wanted to start with some basic pathophysiology. Now, Mm -hmm. what is the role of the thyroid? Can you explain to us? Really, really simply, the thyroid gland produces thyroid hormones that are involved in regulating the body's metabolic rate. So we think about, you know, your basal metabolism. Mm. But from a practical perspective, it's actually far, far deeper than that. It's involved in controlling our heart, our our musculoskeletal system, our digestive system, Mm. um, bone maintenance, and really, really important brain development. So Mm. when we're talking from a fertility perspective, uh, and and during pregnancy, in the baby's first trimester, mm. um, the baby relies solely on maternal thyroid hormones for its growth and development, mm. right? So the baby's um, own thyroid doesn't kind of kick in until 12 weeks gestation. So mm. it's so, so important that women have their thyroid sorted (laughs) prior to pregnancy. And as you said, you know, 10 to 15% of women in reproductive years and one in five women will develop thyroiditis Mm. during pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're really high statistics. And as as clinicians, I think that's why, you know, we just see this so frequently. Yes. But can you let us know, you know, what nutrients are involved in that thyroid hormone metabolism? Because we're going to do a lot of deep diving today, but I want to mm. just sort of set the scene with some basics. Mm. Yeah. So this it's quite a complex process, mm. right? So the, the first thing that sort of happens is that the, the thyroid gland um, traps iodide, right, the, uh, the iodide iron, mm-hmm. and it actively transports the iodide from the blood in the, into the cytosol yeah. um, and the thyroid gland contains most of the body's iodide. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. At the same time that that's going on, the Golgi apparatus is sort of making this thyroglobulin, which is a long protein chain of mm-hmm. lots and lots and lots of amino acids. And one of the main amino acids within that is tyrosine. Mm. Okay, so we've got iodide that's been trapped and we've got tyrosine that's attached to this thyroglobulin molecule, Mm -hmm. okay? 
then what happens is the iodide can't actually bind to the tyrosine in that form. It right. needs to be um, iodinized, basically. So it gets converted from iodide into iodine. Right. Okay. And the nutrient that does that is iron. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so far we've got tyrosine, we've got iodide or iodine, and we've got iron. Yes. And so that iron changes the iodide into iodine. Um, so it's an oxidation process that's done by a peroxidase enzyme. Yep. Um, and then the iodine is able to attach to the tyrosine molecules on the thyroglobulin chain. Right. Okay. It, it's so like a symphony, isn't it? It's like a dance, yeah, all of these yeah. little steps that um, yep. build up. But, you know, one of the first thoughts that came to my mind was, boy, I know a lot of iron deficient women. <laughs> so, exactly. and, and I think that's one thing that is really, really commonly missed mm. in clinical practice, the connection between iron and thyroid. And of course, some of the symptoms of iron deficiency is fatigue, shortness of breath, mm. with cold sensitivity, cold hands and feet. Yeah. And they are exactly the same clinical deficiency symptoms mm. of thyroid issues. Yeah. Yeah. So I really do believe that's one of those things that is is missed clinically. Yes. Um, the importance of that iron in being able to convert that iodide to iodine so that we can make the thyroid hormones in the first place. Yeah, I think that is such a great clinical pearl to take on board today. Amazing. Mm. Yeah. And and then it, it, it even keeps going after that because then, of course, what we're making is we're making T4. So basically that process makes um, T1 and T2 and yeah. then T1 and T2 join together to make T3 yeah. and then two T2s join together to make T4. <laughs> so that's where we get to T3 and T4, yeah. right? And then basically of our total thyroid hormone pool, yeah. we make anywhere between 80 to 93% of our thyroid hormones as T4 and that's basically inactive. Right. And then we make around 7 to 20% as active T3. Mm-hmm. Then we need to convert the T4 to the T3 and we need selenium for that process Yeah, and we need zinc for that process. Mm. Then we need to be able to transport the um, thyroid hormones around the body and we need a, another a protein transporter called transthyretin, which is vitamin A dependent. Yeah. So, and then vitamin A also affects our thyroid hormone receptors on our cells, as does vitamin D. Mm. So, it's more than just iodine, which I mean, everyone sort of thinks thyroid, oh, let's make sure we've got a whole heap of iodine going in. Yeah. But it's so much deeper than that. And quite frankly, I would not prescribe high dose iodine without having some sort of clinical relevance and clinical reason for doing that. Um, yeah, because we can obviously cause problems with that. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, yeah, we, we could dive into the iodine story um, mm. down the track as well, but but I would agree high-dose iodine is a big no for me as well. Mm. Um, mm. But I love that description of that we need the iron to convert the iodide into mm. iodine, that selenium and zinc are required for the conversion mm. of T4 to T3 and the transport is vitamin A dependent. It just shows us you know, how much is involved in this thyroid picture and it's not as simple as it looks. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> mm. what, what about the role of, of T4 and T3 and then thyroid antibodies and, of course, the reverse T3? Now, what are the actual roles of those in metabolism or in the body? Well, yeah. So as, as I basically said, T4 is effectively, it's effectively inactive, mm. but we need to have that really good T4 thyroid hormone pool so that it can convert to the active T3 and mm. then T3 can attach to the receptor sites and do whatever it is supposed to be doing to that particular cell, Mm -hmm. right? So we have um, thyroid hormone receptors on just about every single cell of our body. Yeah, Okay, so the Mm -hmm. actions of T3 
are very, very broad, and then our deficiency symptoms are equally as broad. Mm. So we need um, T3 for um, ovulation, we need it for fertility, we need it for the basal metabolic rate, you mm. know, making sure our body is actually functioning, is actually doing what it should be doing. Yeah, yeah. Reverse T3 is a really interesting one. It so is. It, it, it does. Yeah. It, it, it stirs up a bit of controversy, what don't you think, Emma? Well, that's that's why I do want to really cover this today because I think it does. Uh, it is a little controversial, so let's talk about it. Mm, all right. So when we're converting T4, right? So the the conversion of T4 to T3 happens in the liver, and mm. I'm not sure that everyone's aware of that either. Yeah. Okay. So. Around 40% of our available T4 is converted into T3. And during normal circumstances, about 20% of that T4 goes to reverse T3, okay. which, as you know, is like an inactive version of T3. Yeah. So it's that reverse T3 is being produced all the time. And our body, when it's at a, at a, at a low level, low belt, our body kind of goes, yeah, cool, great. We've got a little bit of reverse T3, mm. no worries. Let's just clear it from the system. No big deal. Okay. However, reverse T3 does have, in my opinion, a very, very important role from a stress perspective. Okay. So reverse T3 is produced in higher amounts um, during times of stress mm. during times of fasting or starvation yeah. or any sort of illness such as liver disease or you know weird fatty diets of mm. people are, are not feeding their self their, their bodies properly and it's simply your body's way of shutting down metabolism of preventing you from burning fat preventing you from using your carbohydrates because if we think about the role of stress stress is all about survival, right? Yes. It's about running from the woolly mammoth. Yeah. The last thing you want to be doing when you're in a stressful situation is burning through all your all of your fat stores mm. because you don't know when your next meal is going to be. Yeah. So if you've got a woolly mammoth on your tail, you're under extreme stress. You are trying to get to safety. Mm. You don't want to be either A pooing, B yeah. having to stop to, you know, change a tampon. Yeah. C, having a baby, or D, needing to stop and eat some food. Mm. So your whole metabolic process shuts down, yeah, slows down, and that's so that when you get to safety, you still have a reserve. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Mm. And, and I think the underpinning is that uh, cortisol and stress levels mm. have so much to do with this reverse Absolutely. T3 situation and, and that Absolutely. increased conversion to reverse mm. T3. Just on um, that with cortisol. So this happens if your cortisol is either high or low, mm -hmm. right? It also happens if your adrenaline is high and it happens again if your iron is low. Okay. And again, it happens when your iron's low because you don't have enough iron to keep making your thyroid hormones. Mm. So it all just shuts down, shuts down and shuts down. And how that can then present is a hypothyroidism, even a subclinical hypothyroidism, mm. right, where you, you have all of those hypothyroid symptoms, difficulty losing weight, um, unexplained weight gain, cold sensitivity, hair thinning, hair drying, loss of hair, all of those really common symptoms then start to present because of this elevated reverse T3. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But when, when and how do you see reverse T3 being a useful metric in clinical practice? Because when I see reverse T3 elevated on a blood, mm. like elevated in testing, it alerts me to something else is going on, right? It alerts me to why is this person's reverse T3 elevated at this point in time? Yeah. What's going on for them? Is it that they have, that this isn't a thyroid issue per se? Mm. 
is this a stress issue? And it changes your clinical practice. Yeah. Because if reverse T3 is elevated, remember that it happens in the liver, right? Yeah. So the conversion of T4 to T3 or the conversion of T4 to reverse T3 is happening in the liver. Mm. So straight away I go, okay, is something wrong in the liver? So do we have, you know, non-alcohol fatty liver disease? As yes, example, yes. Right? Or is the, is the liver just not very happy at the moment? Is something going on from that metabolic perspective? Or is it a stress response? Because yeah. if it's a stress response or something happening in the liver, then it's not the patient's thyroid per se. The thyroid is not the problem. Yeah, so then you're barking up the wrong tree trying exactly. to treat a thyroid yeah. issue. That's when, right. Yeah, and in fact, it's either most likely a stress issue or a liver issue. So when we're talking about this situation with the thyroid and reverse T3, you know, what herbs or nutrients do you use to treat elevated reverse T3 mm. that is actually mm-hmm. driven by liver dysfunction? Not mm-hmm. cortisol, but liver dysfunction. Yeah, yeah. So nothing to do with cortisol. Mm. It's 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 about the, so I use a lot of the lipotropics for, yeah. for the fat loss to get because what we're trying to do is get the fat then the fat accumulation out of the liver. Yes, and I really focus um, nutritionally as well here. So I'm using things like acetyl L carnitine, right. um, taurine, glycine inositol, choline, even vitamin C and selenium. Yes. And even um, some folate and B12. But yeah. my, my main sort of focus is that carnitine, taurine, glycine, inositol um, and choline sort of nutrients there. Yeah. Then herbally, the absolutely globe artichoke. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I, I don't know, I think globe artichoke is – sometimes really underestimated in what it does as well. Like mm. it's so amazing for for constipation as well. And, yeah. and when you've got this um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, then all sorts of digestive com- com- complaints can happen and globe artichoke is brilliant for that. Yeah. And then I put in some beautiful things like St. Mary's thistle and Shisandra. Yeah, You know, fantastic. Shisandra for the, the cellular replication, the liver cell repu- um, replication. So yeah. um, they're sort of the things – that I really love using from that that lipotropic perspective. Emma, can I share with you? I just want to share with you a case. <laughs> I'd love right? to. There was, there was um, a, 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 and it was a male, interestingly, that yeah. I was treating, and he came to me with th- what seemed to be thyroid issues, mm-hmm. very much a pear-shaped and um, just not feeling like he could lose um, weight appropriately for what he was eating. And okay. we went on this big, long journey and we found that his reverse T3 was through the roof. Okay. Um, it was actually one of the highest I had seen. So what kind really... of number, though, are we talking? Because I'd love to what hear number? some numbers. Yeah, okay. roughly. So he, he was at over 700. Right. Um, yeah. And at one point he had been at 869. Wow. Okay. And ideally we really want that reverse T3 to be below 300. Mm-hmm. Um, his T3 was quite good. His T3 was at 5.6 and his TSH was completely normal. So we're looking at this process going, all right, what's going on here? And yeah. we went through the whole process of is it cortisol, high cortisol low cord- or low cortisol. He's he's a, a very successful businessman. So right. um, there was a lot of stress. But ultimately what we found, which sort of surprised all of us. So mm. we actually did a Dutch plus on him, right. right? And because he was basically suffering essentially what we would relate as a female condition. Yeah. Right? So I went, you know what, let's see what estrogen's doing. Let's see what your liver and your bowels are doing with estrogen. Yeah. And they were all beautiful. His liver was doing a beautiful job with estrogen. So mm-hmm. I kind of thought nothing else of it. And then I went, you know what? But just because that's fine doesn't mean his liver is fine. And what we did finally discover was that he had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease Mm. and it was caused by hemochromatosis. He was depositing so much iron in his liver, but nobody had ever found that. He's 40 and no one had found that there was a hemochromatosis there. Yeah, And that was really one of the things that I went, okay, this presented like a thyroid issue. Mm. It presented like a cortisol issue. Yes. But it was actually 
a liver issue, a non-alcohol liver dependent. That is a really um, fascinating mm, case, isn't it? And and it mm, just goes to show that you have to keep peeling the layers of the onion mm, back to get absolutely. to the root cause. We are all practicing functional medicine of some kind, and it's, That's right. it is about the root cause. That's um, right. And and if we hadn't kept going, mm, we would still be sitting here going, "Oh well, you know, why isn't the reverse T three going down if we're treating stress and cortisol and." You know, where we would still be stuck in it yeah. had we not investigated more into what the liver was doing. Yeah. Some mm. fantastic tips there. I love the lipotropics for the liver support, the carnitine, mm. taurine, glycine, choline, and inositol. And of course, those beautiful herbs, globe, artichoke, St. Mary's thistle, uh, and uh, shazandra, just beautiful herbs that we can use again and again for such great results. Um, mm. I wanted to ask about testing those. So, how mm-hmm. is subclinical thyro- hypothyroidism? actually assessed and, and what tests are done in a standard blood panel? <laughs> Let, let's get the definitions and, and what, what, what we're seeing. Let's get this out. Okay. Mm. So when we do a, a a thyroid test, right, and they will refer to it as a, a you know, full thyroid test mm. and it's literally, usually just TSH. Correct. Okay. And if we're really lucky, we might get T4 tested as well. Okay. And even though they say we've done a full thyroid test, it's like, "Mm, no, you haven't. Mm. So remember that TSH comes from the pituitary gland in your brain. So by testing TSH, we're actually testing your brain's communication with your thyroid. Mm. We're not even testing the thyroid hormones. Yeah. Right? So it's just a little bit. Um, it's just missing a lot of details. Yes. So TSH, the other thing is that a lot of the labs are still using very old reference ranges, you know, mm. where TSH should be sitting anywhere between 0.5, some say 0.5 to 5, some say 0.5 to 4. Mm. But they're, they're still old reference ranges and the most current reference ranges changed in 2003 and it's 0.5 to 3. Right. Right. Okay. But most labs aren't even don't even have that as a reference range. I've seen one recently that was some tests coming from Sydney that had that reference range. Okay. So then within that, ideally, it, that's the range. The optimal place I would like to see TSH is somewhere between 0.5 to 1.5. You know, so one is pretty spot on. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm pretty okay if it's anywhere between 0.5 to 1.5. Yeah. Um, but once it starts, you know, if somebody comes to me and says, oh, my thyroid's fine and the TSH is coming back at 4.5, my, every alarm bell is ringing in my head. It's like yeah. that is just not okay. So if that patient comes into you and mm. they've had their TSH checked, mm-hmm. what then do you need to refer them for? And these are private blood tests, so patients yeah. will be required to pay for them. Pay, But yes. what, what tests would you then send a patient on for? T4, yep. T3, reverse T3. The T3 to reverse T3 ratio, mm-hmm. uh, the thyroid peroxidase antibody, the thyroglobulin antibody, mm-hmm. and then even um, if I'm suspecting Gray's disease, then we kind of want to know what your TSH receptor antibodies are doing or even your thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulin. They're a little bit more unusual. I'm more looking at the TSH, T4, T3, reverse T3, the T3 to reverse T3 ratio, TPO, and um, thyroglobulin antibody. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Because I noticed on the Australian Thyroid Association website, they state that a TSH of around 1.0, a T4 Mm. at the high end of normal, and a T3 exactly in the middle of the range gives best results. I mean, do you agree with that or not? Yeah, I I love TSH sitting, as I said, between 0.5 and 1.5. So one is absolutely, in my opinion, is absolutely ideal. Yes. T4, I definitely want at the higher end of the range. Now, again, some labs are 
sort of talking 9 to 25, other labs are talking 9 to 19. Mm. So this is where it gets a little bit muddied, but that's where we go, okay, higher end of the range. Okay. So 19, 20, 21, if it's the if it's up to the, you know, if, if the range is in the 20s. Um, T3, I like that sitting at 4.8. So, yeah, pretty much smack bang in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, 4.8, 4.9, far up to 5. Once it starts getting too high, we can go into that hyperthyroid state. Mm-hmm. But, again, it's really important to be measuring it against the reverse T3 as well. Okay. So that reverse T3, again, the range is usually somewhere between 250 to 500, somewhere like that. Mm. I like reverse T3 to be below 300. Okay. Um, But again, I still want to look at that T3 to reverse T3 ratio. So if anyone doesn't know, the way that you work, you can work that out and basically you divide your T3 mm-hmm. by your reverse T3 and then multiply it by 100 okay. and that will give you your ratio and that ratio should be between 1.2 and 2.2. Okay, great. Because Ideally, I... mm-hmm. sorry Emma to cut you off, yeah. ideally with that, that ratio though, again, I want it to be at around 2. So even though the range is 1.2 to 2.2, yeah. I like that T3 to reverse T3 ratio to be two. Okay, amazing. So mm. let me synopsis that for the listeners. Mm. So in an <laughs> ideal in an ideal thyroid picture, you would see a TSH of around 1.0, a T4 mm-hmm. around 19, a T3 mm-hmm. of 4.8, a mm-hmm. reverse T3 below 300, and then mm-hmm. a T3 to reverse T3 ratio of two. Yes. Great. Exactly. Is there a too low number for reverse T3 or, you know, conversely? Oh, absolutely. Um, There is, but there's not a lot of research that sort of says what it's doing. But if I see, so if I see reverse T3 drop below 250, for example, and I have seen that, then again, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, where does reverse T3 come from? It comes from the from the conversion of T4 to reverse T3 in the liver. Mm. What is going on again with the conversion? Okay. Because remember, normally we should be converting about 20% of our T4 to that reverse T3. Why is that not happening? Is the T4 dropping too low? Okay. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, reverse T3 is better low than high, absolutely, but we still don't want it too low because it indicates that something else is still going on. Yes. When you see someone with, with subclinical hyperthyroidism, mm. what does mm. that look like? Yeah. So what it looks like is subclinical hypothyro- hypothyroidism mm-hmm. is where the, the patient is presenting with all of those typical symptoms of sluggish thyroid, hypothyroidism, and that's including things like, you know, the inability to lose weight or the unexplained weight gain, cold sensitivity, the the hair falling out, Mm. um, fertility issues, whatever the specific set of hypothyroid symptoms are, and yet it hasn't reached the clinical level yet. And what I mean by that is it hasn't reached the biochemical, the, the testing. The testing is not reflecting okay. that there is a problem yet. So in other words, those ideal numbers that we mentioned just a few minutes mm-hmm. ago, could they mm-hmm. be the numbers on the piece of pathology that the patient's no, sharing gen- with you? No, generally they're not. Okay. Generally they're not in the ideal ranges. Generally you would see a TSH starting to nudge a little bit too high. Mm-hmm. You'd see the T4 you know, sitting around 13 or 14, still in range. Okay. But at that lower end, see, as soon as I see T4 starting to go below 14, we should not be seeing T4 below 14. Okay. You know, T4, the, one of the most important nutrients, as we talked about, is iodine. Um, and once we see T4 starting to drop below 14, I'm starting to think, is this person getting enough iodine? Mm. Like that is starting to stimulate that thought process in my mind. So we would see TSH starting to push up, 
T4 starting to push down. Mm. T3 might still be okay hovering around, you know, 4, 4.2, 4.3, but it's not in that ideal. So everything, the thyroid hormones are starting to go a little bit low. Yes. The TSH is starting to go a little bit high. The reverse T3 probably hasn't been tested. (laughs) Yeah, most likely not. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And and the patient is starting to feel the symptoms. They're, they're, They're really starting to feel it. And yet their thyroid results are not blown out of the water yet. Okay. Where do you see the role of basal body temperature charting for thyroid? Like how accurate is it? Where do you use it? Okay, so I I do use it in in my a lot of my fertility patients. Mm, although those likewise, do their yeah. head in sometimes when they have to <laughs> test at the same time every day. Um, I want to see the basal body temperature first thing in the morning before they've moved. I want to see I want to see it thirty six point three and above. Yeah. Okay. Once it starts to drop below, and this is this is actually some information from you know the beautiful naturopath Francesca Nay. She's mm. in Sydney and she's been around for forever. This is a lot of um, the work she was doing, and uh, I really want to see temperature above thirty six point three. Yeah. A couple dropping below is okay, particularly if that's in the follicular phase. But if if they're consistently below thirty six point three, that's really setting off some alarm bells about whether the patient is ovulating, um, mm-hmm. and it it does drive towards fertility issues. So could this be, you know, for a patient that doesn't have the means to do all the extensive Mm. thyroid testing, could Mm. this be a means for us to get some information and possibly start some low-dose iodine and see whether that makes a difference? Yes, that's mm. that's exactly what I would do. Okay. So if, if it, because the extensive thyroid testing, you know, you're looking at 220 and above, and yeah. on top of supplements and appointments and da da da, it just can be become quite um, unreachable for some people. So yeah. to to test their basal temperature, get a good quality thermometer. It doesn't have to be a 200 300 thermometer. Just a you know. thermometer, get them to test every morning at the same time Mm. before they get up. And if it's consistently below 36.3, it would be ideal if there was a GP who could then just test their TSH and their T4, which we can pretty much still get those two are pretty standard and should be covered by Medicare without the patient needing to pay Mm -hmm. more for those. And if we've got a temperature below 36.3 consistently and a T4 that's nudging down at around 14 or below or 14, 15 or below, then I would start thinking about, all right, let's put some low-dose iodine in there because there's a clinical reason to do that. Mm. Yeah, I just think it's so important to make our clinical practices as accessible as possible for Absolutely. patients. And and I think that that's a really good clinical pearl for practitioners to keep in mind uh, for mm. the, you know, patients that, that cannot do those extensive tests. I think, mm. I think that's super mm. helpful. Thank you. Mm. And, and, and it, it does work once we start to see um, T4 coming up, you do see the temperature start to come up. Mm. Yeah, and, and um, the patient will come back and say, oh, I don't have brain fog in the morning like I exactly. used to. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, classic, classic. Yeah, or I've lost those those couple of kilos <laughs> that I was just wanting to, you know, just wanting to drop. No big deal, but just wanting to get those extra kilos off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 so, um, it's great. It is. It's delightful. Um, mm. I wanted to discuss with you, I wanted to pick your brain on the, what I think is an infamous gluten and thyroid situation. <laughs> so yeah. many many practitioners will automatically tell all thyroid patients to avoid gluten. But I wanted to look at well, what does the research say? And in my reading, I came across a 2019 pilot study. So it was just a pilot study and it involved women with Hashimoto's and half were instructed to eliminate gluten for six months while the other half were told to include it. And at the end of the study period, the women who avoided gluten 
had lower levels of thyroid antibodies and interestingly higher vitamin D levels. And Uh, I'm wondering if gluten avoidance is only beneficial in women with an autoimmune component to their thyroid, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay. (laughs) So in my opinion, there are several reasons to remove gluten, okay? Yeah. and most importantly, when there is an autoimmune component. Mm-hmm. If there's not an autoimmune component, then I think that needs to be um, that needs to be a, a clinical decision based on the patient in front of you. Okay. Um, however, I am I don't love gluten, and there's three really main reasons. So okay. the first one is the molecular mimicry or the cross reactivity. Yes. So if you have Hashimoto's or an autoimmune thyroid condition, your immune system is making antibodies that are already attacking your thyroid. Okay. Yes. If we then put gluten into the picture, gluten contains a protein called gliadin. And gliadin is not a particularly favorable protein for our system. We don't deal with it very well. It's quite a large protein. Mm -hmm. And our digestive system doesn't deal with it very well. And so our body views gliadin as a foreign substance. Mm. And it starts to attack the gliadin. But where it's really interesting is that gliadin is very, very similar structurally to transglutaminase, which is an enzyme that's found abundantly in the thyroid gland. Okay. So what your immune system is recognising is that the the gluten, the gliadin, is really similar to your thyroid gland. Mm. So if you already have thyroid antibodies attacking the thyroid, then those antibodies go, oh, okay, there's something else we have to attack that looks exactly like transglutaminase in the thyroid gland, and it's the gliadin. So the antibodies go up even higher in Mm. the presence of gluten because the gluten looks like the thyroid gland. Okay. Yeah. Um, So our immune system really ramps up its attack on that thyroid tissue. Mm-hmm. Um, so then the, the thyroid tissue is under attack, the gliadin is under attack, and if you take that gluten and gliadin out for six months, then the antibodies will drop. And, and people can notice a difference within days. Okay. But for some people it does take that, that sort of six-month period or I like my patients to remove it for six months. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so that's the sort of molecular mimicry. And then the second reason is gluten itself is very inflammatory to the gut. Okay. As I said, you know, gluten and, and the gliadin are really big proteins. We generally don't break them down very well. Mm-hmm. And those large molecules cause inflammation to the gut and a separation of the tight junctions in the cells that line the gut wall. Mm-hmm. Um, and when the gliadin approaches the walls of the gut, the gut becomes more porous, allows the big molecules of gliadin to enter. So we wind up with leaky gut. And again, in response to that, the human body immediately goes to work in raising an immune response. And if you already have those elevated thyroid antibodies, yeah. then you're setting off an even greater immune response. Mm, makes sense. And that, yeah. yeah, that was a, a um, bit of research that was done in 2017. Okay. Um, and then the other the sort of third thing is, you know, most wheat and gluten in Australia is sprayed with glyphosate yeah. somewhere in its production, right? And that could be during the growth of the, the wheat and gluten or after it's been harvested. And the glyphosate is used as, you know, as a, um, to prevent mould. Yeah. But it's an absolute gut irritant mm. and weakens the digestive system as well. Um, and... As a chemical, it can cause thyroid dysfunction itself, right? So it can be a trigger for thyroid dysfunction. You may not have antibodies previously and then suddenly the glyphosate that's on the the gluten or the wheat Mm -hmm. is actually the trigger that sets off the entire immune response. Yeah, it's also fascinating, isn't it? So removing Mm. gluten for those people with 
autoimmune driven thyroid issues. So three reasons, molecular mimicry mm. between the gliadin and the transglutaminase enzyme and that subsequent elevation of thyroid antibodies. Then you've yep. got the gluten, it's inflammatory to the gut and drives intestinal permeability. And then the third yep. was wheat uh, essentially has chemical contamination. Now, <laughs> I actually, this is a good segue because I read this landmark study involving over 1,500 people. It was in 2011, but it mm-hmm. showed an inverse relationship between environmental phthalates and thyroid hormones. And essentially, mm. as urinary phthalate concentrations increased, serum levels of certain thyroid hormones decreased. And the mm. lead researcher said something really interesting that really kind of struck me. He said, this seems like a subtle difference, but if you think about the entire population being exposed at this level you'd see yep. many more thyroid-related effects in people. And a 2020 paper, so very recent, showed mm. that levels of autoimmune thyroid conditions increase the closer people live to areas contaminated with pesticides. Now, mm. this area of environmental impact and thyroid is huge, mm. but I, I just wanted to know, how do you counsel patients on this very overwhelming topic? It's, it's completely overwhelming because, you know, ideally we'd love them to move to another area where there isn't any pesticides <laughs> or phthalates. Yeah. And, you know, as impractical as it is for, for some patients to be able to do a complete thyroid test, it's also completely impractical for them to up and move their lives. Yeah. Um, so it's very much about reducing the exposure where we can. So the removal of phthalates and the removal of pesticides from food sources or it's not just food sources either, Mm. but where they can control it. So phthalates, as an example, you know, we find high levels of phthalates in cosmetics and personal care products and yeah. perfumes, nail polish, hairspray, soap, shampoo, skin moisturizers. You know, we put on, we put something like 168 different chemicals on our face. Mm, it's insane. Um, just, you know, when we get ready in the morning, if we're not using, um, you know, um, phthalate or, or chemical-free products. Mm. Um, and, and that gets into your skin and it affects your your biochemistry, your nutritional biochemistry, yeah. and your hormonal biochemistry. So it really is about removing those phthalates and those pesticides. You're eating organically, biodynamically, um, you know, f- from a farmer's market as much as you can yeah. and just doing everything you can to reduce those phthalates and pesticides in so far is as humanly possible. Yeah, and, and they, um, they are quite ubiquitous. And I often say yes. to patients, look, the first thing I want you to do is every time you finish something in the house, replace, replace it. Replace so it, it's, yes. It's okay, you finish that spray and wipe thing. Mm, <laughs> now you're going to move yeah, across exactly. to a one that's more suitable for you so that, you know, I mean, it will take six months or so, but over time, the 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 burden of the chemical burden is decreased That's right. and That's also exactly right. you know ensuring they have good de- detoxification capacity is important That's as absolutely. well absolutely right? yeah yes. So making sure their body can actually rid those, if there's still some exposure, making sure their body can actually get rid of those um, those toxins mm. uh, effectively and efficiently. And again, that of course comes back to, you know, five organs of detoxification, and, and liver is a big one involved in that. It's huge, um, isn't it? Mm. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. The other thing, just with. Um, with that as well, Emma, is, yeah. um, you know, is filtered water. Mm. I, I, I think people forget about water. And when we look at the, even if we look at the periodic table, yes. right, where the fluoride, the iodide and bromide are on the um, periodic table, they are all halogens, yes. right? Fluoride we find in, in non-filtered water. The bromide is in crappy, toxic bread, um, and then the iodide is in our salt. Now, those three things all compete with each other. Yeah. So if you're having non-filtered 
water, mm. you've got high levels of fluoride that then displaces your iodide and affects your thyroid hormone manufacture as well. Yeah, look, I and always, you, I'm always saying to patients, if you don't have a filter, you are the filter. And I think it's, exactly. it's, that, it's that simple, <laughs> right? It is that yes. simple. Um, mm-hmm. Just before we close out, though, I would just love one little recommendation on building a successful clinical practice because you, you know, you are incredibly successful in our industry, but I just love one little key takeaway for our listeners. You do you and stay in your lane, I reckon. Yeah, yeah I love it. Yeah, just just do what you love and and how you love doing it and um and and sitting within your own expertise or your own area of interest and when I was studying I just one of my lecturers said Miranda can you come up on uh, come and stand up in front of the class and draw the hormonal cycle and I did not <laughs> want to deal with women's bits mm. I just I wanted to do digestion yeah? yeah and I didn't want to do women's bits and then I stood up in in front of the class and had to draw the hormonal cycle off the top of my head and I could like mm. I just knew it I just got it so for me it was like oh okay I'll, I'll do I'll do me I'll do what what I'm what I feel like I'm good at and what what has touched me personally yeah. um, and what I what I love the areas that I really love work for me like work for me is fun I, I love what I do absolutely love it I think that's really important too. yeah I would agree I love what I do too but it's abundantly mm. clear that that you love what you do and thank you so much for all that you bring uh, to our industry it's just so invaluable Oh, thank you, Emma. And same goes back to you. (laughs) You've (laughs) got an incredible practice and and bring incredible knowledge to our industry. Amazing. Fabulous. Miranda, Mm. thank you so much for taking us through this minefield that is the thyroid. (laughs) And we know that thyroid issues can be so complex and being able to really deep dive into it and discuss it is so insightful and instructive. And I think practitioners will have a lot of helpful clinical pearls on herbs and nutrients and diet factors that they can use to start treating thyroid conditions. Mm. So thank you again for being with us today. Absolute pleasure. Amazing. Thank you everyone for listening today. Don't forget that you can find all the show notes, transcripts and other resources from today's episode on the FX Medicine website, fxmedicine.com.au. I'm Emma Sutherland and thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. This podcast is intended as healthcare practitioner education only, and it is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Hi, this is Leah Hechtman. Despite advances in our understanding of the microbial, hormonal, and immunological drivers behind endometriosis, the pain associated with this condition often persists, even after treatment. We now know that people with endometriosis have fundamental neurological and neuropathic differences in how they perceive and handle pain. Join me live online on Wednesday, June 7th for Bioceuticals Clinical Mastery, the neuropsychoangio basis of endometriosis. In this 90-minute session, I'll be diving deep into neurocircuitry, pain perception, neuroangiogenesis, and the underlying pain mechanisms of endo. I'll also be including a case study to demonstrate how my research and clinical approach could translate into clinical practice for you. Go to bioceuticals.com.au to reserve your place today.